10 years ago, I'm talking with my mom on the phone. I'm flying out to Boston for a family wedding. My mother's really excited because my youngest sister, Sherry, is bringing her new boyfriend, JJ, to the wedding from New York City. And my mom is convinced that I'm going to love this guy because his father, who died when he was five years old, had been a magazine publisher and founded his own magazine. And I had always worked in publishing uh, my whole adult life in uh, alternative weeklies and independent music magazines. So I was intrigued. I said, do you recall the name of the magazine? Maybe I've heard of it. She said, I think it was called Creep or Creek. I said, you mean Cream Magazine? She goes, yeah, yeah, that's it, Cream, Cream Magazine. Have you heard of that before? I said, Mom, that's the magazine that turned me bad when I was 12. <laughs> For those of you not familiar with Cream Magazine, in the 70s and 80s, it was the number two music magazine in America. Uh, but it was a lot more crude and rebellious than Rolling Stone. Cream Magazine was ground zero for what's now postmodern rock journalism. The glossy photos exploded off the page. Lester Bangs was the editor. This was the, the uh, magazine that coined the terms punk and heavy metal into music vernacular. The, the staff looked more like a touring band than they did journalists. It's where I learned about sarcasm. It's where I learned to question authority and my heroes equally. And for better or worse, from that first issue I read when I was 12 years old, Cream became my blueprint for life. So yeah, I was familiar with Cream Magazine. <laughs> and then I told my mom, his father's leather jacket is hanging in my roommate's closet. And a few minutes later, my sister calls from New York City, curious about why her boyfriend JJ's father's jacket was hanging in my closet in Los Angeles. Um, you know, which made sense because Barry Kramer died in 1981 and he lived in Detroit where Cream Magazine was based. So I explained how the jacket ended up in my closet. You see, my roommate Tom grew up in Detroit, Rock City, home of Cream Magazine, and his older brother, known as Ribs, worked in the mailroom at Cream Magazine as a gopher at the time that Barry Kramer died. Now, JJ's mother, Barry's widow, Connie, was getting rid of uh, her husband's effects after he passed away, and Ribs had a similar physical build to her husband, so she gave him three leather jackets, since he's basically paid in records and concert tickets. Now, Ribs grew up to become a hoarder on a family farm in rural Detroit. <laughs> so several years later, Tom returns to visit his brother, and walking among these towers of clutter and garbage, are these three amazing leather jackets from the 1970s. He realizes they're Barry Kramer's, he immediately takes them to LA with him because they need to be put back into circulation. <laughs> now, I never saw the first two jackets, only in photos. Um, but the first one was the coolest jacket I ever saw. It was soft black leather, diagonal cut, leather strands coming down, Buckles, straps, the works. Lead singer jacket. The kind of jacket that Steven Tyler of Aerosmith would wear. A friend of ours who played guitar in Buckcherry, the third greatest Sunset Strip glam metal band ever, <laughs> took it on a European tour and let a woman backstage wear it, never saw the jacket or the woman again. The second jacket, more of a drummer's jacket. It was like a heavy leather studded jacket meant for riding motorcycles in Detroit conditions. That was taken by another friend of ours on an Asian tour with the Rolling Stones and it met a similar fate to the first jacket. <laughs> the third jacket, the one hanging in my roommate's closet, not as cool as the other two. Still retro leather, funky color like an off camel. Uh, kind of the, the kind of jacket that the band's manager would wear. You know, perfect for signing contracts and smoking a doobie with the Eagles. Uh, so I took a picture of this jacket because I was still in the closet, sent it to my sister. A few minutes later, she texts me back. Connie recognizes the jacket as her ex-husband's jacket, her deceased husband's jacket, and she remembered ribs. 
So I tell my roommate when he comes home, and he allows me to bring the jacket to LA with, I mean to Boston with me for the wedding, with one caveat, don't lose the jacket. I'm like, yeah, no problem, man. So I meet JJ at the wedding, and he's a nice guy. He's not as rock and roll as I was hoping. I was hoping he'd have long hair or cool mustache or visible tattoos. He's a corporate attorney. Um, that's all right, though. Uh, he, my sister likes him. That's all that matters. Um, so the night's moving on. I say, hey, JJ, you want to see your dad's jacket? He's like, yeah. So we go to my hotel room, and in the closet, it's the only thing in there hanging. There's a light over it, illuminating it. It looks like a museum piece. <laughs> JJ's like, wow. I go, why don't you try it on? So he puts it on. It fits him perfectly. He's glowing. His eyes are freaking anime style. I take a picture of it. I'm like, he's like, I feel a charge running up and down my arm. I said, dude, take that jacket home with you. That's your jacket. He's like, thanks, man. So I go back to LA. My roommate's asking me if I showed him the jacket. I said, yeah, and it fit him perfectly, and I gave it to him. He says, dude, now he has to marry your sister. Otherwise, he's going to be the biggest jerk ever. He actually used non-PBS language. Um, <laughs> Fortunately for all involved, my sister and JJ did get married. They have a boy and a girl, a home in Columbus, Ohio, and in that home, in a closet, hangs his father's jacket. Yeah, and no matter what happens with the rest of my life, whatever I achieve, wherever I go, I will always, always be the crude, rebellious, sarcastic, straight, forward, rock and roll, uncle of the grandchildren of Cream Magazine. <laughs>